Fear not, for I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. Be strong and courageous. Be strong and very courageous. That's what you told Joshua. Well, here I am, God. So show me how to stare at the waves and smile. Teach me how to see the dark sky and dance. Show me to live in such a way that I never forget your word. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. For the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. If the choice is to fear or to trust you and fear not, I choose you. Church, you doing good? So good to be with you. Um, I just want to make another quick announcement here because I feel like Pastor Andy kind of undersold how good men's event is going to be. And let me just tell you about the dessert, okay? Because I feel like you did a good job with the burgers, double, triple patty burgers. That's going to be good. We've also added a baked potato bar, side note, side plate, if you will. Friends, we have amazing women in our church who are making homemade fresh pies for our guys' night out event. Listen, if that doesn't get you there, then maybe the $100 gift card to Canadian Tire will. That's also a prize. We love, I, all the guys are like, what? All the guys right now are so excited to think like they might win to go into Canadian Tire. There's something awesome about a guy going into Canadian Tire for nine hours on a Saturday, right? We would love for you to join us for this. Um, I, I just really believe that, like it was said last week, we, we want to connect. And I hear so many times in a year, when's the next guys night? When's the hymn night? Listen, it's right there. So sign up, okay? We want to we want to meet with you. We want to have fun. We want to laugh. We want to gather as men. We want to gather as a church. And I just would pray and hope that you would join us. Beard not required, okay? Trust me, because I would not get in. So please. Join us for this. It's going to be fun. There is limited space. There's limited tickets. They're flying out. So sign up today. Join us for that. It's going to be a lot of fun. Pastor Andy has a word he's sharing. It's going to be great. We'd love for you to come. Um, like it was said, we are in week number two of a series titled Fear Not. And uh, the, the goal of this series is not just to talk about fears. In fact, the goal of this series is to remind you, specifically if you call yourself a Christian here, that God actually asks you not to live in fear. He actually commands. He says, I've called you not to live in fear, but with power and love and in a sound mind. Like, he gives us tools. He gives us verses. He commands us to fear not. And the goal of last week was to remind you, not that there is no fear in life. That would be so silly, right? Of course. Like, we, we face fear. Often, we face fear. And so the goal was for you to understand this, that in life, there is fear. In life, there is trouble. In life, you will face fear. But fear not, for he goes with you. Amen? Fear not, he goes with you. Do not be discouraged. Do not be dismayed. Our God goes with you. And that's the whole point. That's the whole idea of last week. It's not that there isn't fear. It's that our God goes with us. And can I just say for a moment, can we just take a, a praise break, if you will? I think there's people in here who can testify to that. That's actually really important for you to understand that actually you can say, I'm, I am a living testimony that in my darkest moment, in my hardest moment, when I was most discouraged, I know that although fear was creeping up, my God was bigger. My God was stronger. That in my life and in my family, I saw God move. Come on. May I remind you that that testimony isn't just for you. It's definitely not to pump me up right now. I'll be fine. I've got lots to preach. I've got lots to go. It's for the person beside you who is struggling. It's for the, there is someone in here probably who is facing fear as we speak and feels like, I don't see him. Friends, this is a church that, has, like, that is in its 100th year of history saying, no, we have seen it. We've seen it in the past. We're seeing it again. And we pray and we know we will continue to see it in the future that our God goes with us. Fear not. And that's the heartbeat of this series. And so as we continue on in week number two, we're in a, we're in a great spot. In fact, we're not just uh, following Joshua here. We kind of take a, a side moment where we follow the Israelites' story, but we actually encounter this woman who is brave and faithful. If you got a Bible, go ahead and go to um, Joshua 2. Uh, it'll be on the screen in a moment, page 170 in the blue Bible in front of you. While we get there, just to share a brief story of kind of what we're talking about today. Recently, on the weekends, I do my very best to sleep in. 
And so I'm just praying and hoping that I get to see seven. If I can see, if I can get to 7 a.m., I am a happy dad. Can I get an amen for someone in the house? Like, that's a good day, friends. Um, usually it's the fives. Uh, sometimes we get sixes, and by the grace of God, maybe 702. And so that was the hope a couple weeks ago. And my kids woke up at like 557, and I was like, go downstairs. You know, like, Georgia, you know what to do. I'm so tired. Grab yourself some Cheerios, put on the show. It's the weekend. I don't care, leave me alone, you know? And, uh, and so I just was like kind of snoozing, but not really asleep. And uh, I got up about half an hour later or so, come downstairs, and my kids, Georgia, all cuddled up, her favorite blanket, watching her show, little cup of Cheerios, just the sweet, my sweet, wonderful, does nothing wrong ever Georgia, was right there where she should be. And beside her was Bowman. <laughs> Shirt off, leaning back, with not like a small bowl, but the like baking sized thing of brown sugar, no joke, with a serving spoon. Like, you know the serving spoon you do with the carrots at Thanksgiving and Christmas? That spoon, eating brown sugar by the spoonful. And, it, and only way Bo could, he goes, oh, hey dad. Brown sugar just all the way down his chest, like his little body, just cut the whole couch. Those who are laughing have never had to clean out brown sugar off a couch. That's not funny. That's not funny. And I'm like, Bo, and instantly I'm like in full panic dad mode, like, what are you doing? And I'm like, got the vacuum out. And I'm like, good thing I went to Kenny Tire this weekend. Like I'm, you know, I'm really giving her and, and it's so loud. She's like, why is the vacuum on? I'm like, cause your, your son is eating brown sugar. You know, you ever do that move where you instantly just point at, he's no longer your kid for the next six minutes. Your son is eating brown sugar on the couch. And I'm pulling them aside, I'm like kneeling down on one knee, I'm like, Bo, I love you, but what are you doing to me? It's 6.36, I need coffee, like we can't do this. And he's like, Dad, I'm sorry, and he's saying all these things, and finally he goes, Dad, Dad, it's just so tasty. It's just so nummy, it's, it's so good. I had to have it, Dad. You know what's hilarious? He's done this before with chocolate chips. Like this kid is in a pattern that needs the power of Jesus to break. And I think sometimes when I, when I was reflecting where we're headed today and I was thinking about this because we're going to talk about Rahab who, who is faced with the decision where she is filled with the fear of man or she has to make a decision based out of the fear of God. And I think sometimes we have, I know I have, let me just speak for myself, I have talked about the fear of man and how we should have a healthier fear of fear of God where we base our decisions out of. And I sometimes feel like the fear of man is just more tangible. It's like in front of our face and often we succumb to its pressure. But I don't know if that's always the case. I think often we're a lot more like Bo, where he knows dad will wake up. He could come up and be like, dad, can you please make me some oatmeal? I'm starving. And I'll, I'll be like, yeah, I'll get up, bud, sure. But he doesn't want to do that. <laughs> I, I think genuinely, well, he's a four-year-old, so that's one thing. But like, I think genuinely he just wants to fill his need now. I think sometimes the fear of man is right in front of us now, and by succumbing to it, we ease our anxiety and desire. And I think when the fear of God sometimes is the long game, it's the patient wait. It's the, I know there's fear here, and I know my God will see me through it, but it's not gonna look the way I want it to. And so we try and take control of our need, and we try and fill it really quick, and yet we're still left wanting more and frustrated and still in fear. You see in the comparison here, like, like Bo just comes down, he needs to fill his hunger need, and he is always hungry. That kid doesn't stop eating. And I think for us, it's very similar, where we're just like trying to fill the need, trying to fill that, that angst, trying to fill that anxiety or desire as quick as we can. And I think maybe I have not done, a, I've done a disservice saying, oh, the fear of man is just pressure, and it's just heated, it's right now, when in fact, I think we just don't like to wait to play that long game, to be obedient, to, to ask God, how are you asking me to respond to what is in front of me right now. What are you actually saying to me? And I think Rahab does a great job of that. Let's read, read it together. Joshua 2, it says this, uh, starting verse one, right from the top. Then Joshua, son of Nun, secretly sent two spies from Shittim to go and look over the land. He said this, especially Jericho. So they went and entered the house of a prostitute named Rahab, and they stayed there. The king of Jericho was told, look, some of the Israelites have come here tonight to spy out the land. So the king of Jericho sent this message to Rahab. Bring out the men who came to you and entered your house because they have come to spy out the whole land. But the woman had taken the two men and hid them. She said, yes, the men came to me, but I don't know where they had come from. At dusk, when it was time to close the city gate, they left. I don't know where they went. 
Go after them quickly. You may catch up to them. Verse 6, but she had actually taken them up to the roof and hidden them under the stalks of flax she had laid out on the roof. So the men set out in pursuit of the spies on the road that leads to the fords of Jordan. And as soon as the pursuers had gone out, the gate was shut. Friends, Rahab is a prostitute in Jericho. She is, um, I'm sure horrible things have happened to her. I'm sure she's taken abuse, been treated like a commodity, soulless. Um, Women were already treated as secondhand citizens. I can't imagine what she had went through, the abuse and pain. Now Jericho, fairly significant. It's underneath sea level, and so although it's amongst the desert, this place specifically has is quite fertile. It's, it's known as like the Palm City. It's 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 like it has water, it has resource. You had to go through here, the big gate. So this was very important, the largest kind of most important city for the Israelites to conquer. So they come in. She hides them. She hides them. She doesn't give them over. She doesn't trick anyone or scheme anyone. She doesn't scheme the Israelites, right? She hides them. And then when the guards come and say, listen, the king is asking you to bring them out, what does she do? She lies. Friend, she lies. Of course she knows where it is. She, she, 100%, she hides the enemy. She hides, technically, her enemy from her king, and she tells them something that's different than the actual truth. James 4.17 literally says this, if anyone then knows the good or the right thing they ought to do but doesn't do it, it is sin for them. I want you to just really immerse yourself in the story for a second. Imagine the fear. Imagine the options, right? A Canaanite prostitute is hiding Israelite spies as she's being interrogated by soldiers. Consider this for a second. Talk about fear. You have the king saying one thing. You, you have this idea of the Israelites and their heritage and what they're, what they're coming back to do and, and all that they need. And you have this whole idea and you have God speaking to her in the middle of this saying, what's the right thing to do? How many times have we had a situation like this in front of us where we're not sure which excuse me, decision to make and that there's that response that we could do, which is to bow down to the fear of men, to feel, you know what, I just don't want to deal with this. I mean, I just don't want to have to, fine, they're upstairs, I'm sorry, whatever your king wants. We have this other option that God is speaking and saying, hold on, I'm calling you, I'm asking you to, to stand out in faith for me here. And we have this angst inside of us. What if they hurt her? Like, they come in. What if they abuse her? What if they search her house? What if they tear it apart? What if they say she can't conduct business anymore, her livelihood? Friends, amongst all of the fear and the confusion and the suspense, Rahab decides, I'm not worried about the spies who want to tear my city down, take it over. I'm not worried about the king who can take my life away. I'm only worried about one thing. What is God asking me to do in this moment? One thing, do I fear more? Do I fear God more or do I fear kings and kingdoms more? And she has to ask this question and we have to respond to this too. Do I fear God more than I fear the kings and kingdoms of the day? And how do I respond? How do I respond in my position as a dad or as a husband? How do I respond in my position as a mom or as a friend or a coworker? How do I respond in this moment? How is God asking you to respond to the fear in your life? When you're faced with it. I think it would be easy for the preacher to say, faith, all, all, all fear is conquered by faith. But friends, there are many ways to respond to fear. This is important. Yes, faith is one response. And Rahab has that. I absolutely believe that. But, but friends, there's also discernment. To take a moment and say, I'm not going to respond emotionally right now. I'm going to respond obediently. And I think Daniel has this, right? When he's headed into the fiery furnace. What does he say? He says, even if, even if we don't make it, I still honor and praise my God and my God only. I don't know what's going on here, but I'm discerning in this moment that even if I die in that furnace, this is the right decision. Paul talks about fleeing. Fleeing. He literally tells us in, in moments of uncertainty, in moments of when you're faced with fear, whatever it is, or sin is right in front of you. What does he say? Run. <laughs> I'll never forget this one moment that had stuck so hard in my heart. I, I, I was visiting friends back in Kelowna. This is when I was just coming back to the Lord and recommitting my heart. And they're like, let's go to this party. And I was like, oh, I didn't want to. I knew what God was doing in my life, and I just, I, I, I was headed out with them. We walked there, and I remember the door opened. I saw the scene, and I was like, I'm out of here. And I drove with them, and I just ran home. Like, just took off in the middle of Christmas break in Kelowna. Snow, hello. Like, I just, poof, gone. I think I was wearing Crocs at the time. Like, I just remember, just, 
Let's, let's be honest, I didn't run that fast. I definitely had some walking breaks. But I, I got out of there, friends. I ran as quick as I could. I flee. Because you know what? I know that this is a place, oh, there's fear in my life, this is sin. I don't want this. I'm out of here. There's different responses to fear, discernment, to flee, to, how about humility? Sometimes we're faced with something and the best thing we can do is just humble ourselves before God and say, I don't know what to do. Jesus on the cross, you know what? If you can take this cup from me, great, but if not, I humble myself before you, God, to do whatever it is you're calling me to do. How about courage, like Joshua? Friends, you can respond to fear in many ways, but God is asking you to slow down and to respond obediently with an idea of the fear of God, not just the fear of man. Are you hearing me this morning? Is someone hearing me? Is Pastor Andy the only one here? Are you hearing me this morning? Thank you, Pastor Andy. Bless your heart, soul, strength, and mind. It's an extra blessing he received because he amened, just saying. (laughs) Verse eight, it says, before the spies lay down for the night, she went up to the roof. This is so great. Listen to this, this conversation they have. Verse nine, and said to them, I know that the Lord has given you this land and that a great fear of you has fallen on us so that all who live in the country are melting in fear because of you. This is what God is doing to the people. We have heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea for you when you came out of Egypt and what you did to Shion and Og, the two kings of the Amorite east in the Jordan, of the Jordan, excuse me, whom you completely destroyed. When we heard of it, this is verse 11, our hearts melted in fear and everyone's courage failed because of you. For the Lord your God is God in heaven above and on earth below. This Canaanite prostitute has more faith has more belief, understands the power of God, has a reverence of God, is in awe and wonder of God more than many of the Israelites. She is in complete understanding and surrender of like, you think I'm worried about what the guards are gonna say? You think I'm truly concerned with what this king can do? Take my livelihood. I'm not messing with the big guy. Like I, there is power and majesty and holiness and wonder and awe that I am not messing with. He parts seas. He moves kingdoms. Kings fall. And you think I'm worried about this king? Now then, verse 12. She understands. She she elevates God and then she says, please swear to me by the Lord that you will show kindness to my family because I have shown kindness to you. Give me a sure sign that you will spare the lives of my father and my mother and my brothers and sisters and all who belong to them, and that you will save us from death. Friends, Rahab, she is well aware of what she's doing. She has a healthy fear of God. She understands his power, his means, and and, and the purpose of the Israelites coming. And yet the question for me still remains a little bit, why did she do what she did? She's facing fear. Is she just really brave? She's facing fear. This whole series is about fear not. We, we find ourselves in situations like this. The cost, I'm sure, is so great to live as a traitor in, in, in the city of Jericho. Why would she help them? Why did she do this? Well, we just answered it, Pastor Lucas. She has a healthy fear of God. Yes, this is true, but listen to what she said. She is fighting for her faith in God, yes, but her faith represents something deeper than just herself. Swear to me by the Lord that you will show kindness to my family that you will spare the lives of my father and mother and my brothers and my sisters. That's verse 12 and 13. Rahab, one more time, let me recap this for you, is a prostitute living in Jericho. And her name, her lineage, lines up and ends up in the lineage of Jesus Christ. Faith in God in the face of fear, friends, may change more than just your moment in direction. Consider this for a moment. Consider the power behind what happens here. Because our fear decisions, I believe, may change. They may, they may face, like, change a moment. They may change a perspective or a circumstance. Our fear decisions may impact those around us, but our faith decisions impact the generations after us. And this really matters. Like, I know if I make a decision based out of fear, it may impact ministry or family, maybe my wife or my kids. But man, when I make a faith decision, when I say, in our house, all we're gonna do is praise God. When I decide that, hey, for us and us five, we will honor God with everything we have, I know that impacts my kids and my kids' kids and my family around me, my brothers and my sisters and my mother and my father. And Are you seeing what I'm saying? This really matters here. And Rahab recognizes that if I make a decision here, 
in faith in God, it has so much more than just my life at its hands. There's so much more. The trajectory is actually being changed from Canaanite prostitute to the lineage of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Friends, there is no situation in here that when you honor, when you kneel down, when you have faith in God, when you don't bow to fear of men, but you only bow to the fear of God and to what he is doing in your life, it can literally change the trajectory of your entire family. That's what we believe. And rather than choosing the easy way out, I wonder what decisions we, we could make if our new decisions about fear and faith, if we rep- recognize that the impact those closest to us yeah, when you put your children's face in mind of your decisions, it changes things. I say this to the six often. I'll say, you know why I'm so hard on you? Because I know my kids are coming up underneath you. I know you're going to be my kid's youth leader. I get it. I get the investment. They understand. Man, Rehab understood that she chose faith in God, not fear in men, and, and something was changing in her heart. Can I just take a minute? I, honor the grandparents in here and the great-grandparents in here who continue to say, my house will honor God. From our, our family will honor the Lord. We'll continue to pray. Friends, I believe that there is, there is still promise and reward and fruit to happen in your families as you continue to pray and believe for that. And we have the decision, don't we? Like, she actually is trying to make an oath here, but there is still a decision to be made. Joshua had to choose to fight the Amalekites. He had to choose to to serve beside Moses for a long time. He chose to reject the golden calf. He chose to believe that God was pulling him out of one area and into the promised land. He chose to take leadership of this moment. And God gives us choices. Friends, you have the choice. He's given you the choice, the free will to decide to choose him. Can I tell you something? He chose you on that cross. God gives you the choice, and he's chosen you, and he's saying, listen, I want to call you out of that. I want to bring you out of that. Set up a legacy of faith. Don't live in fear, but choose me. Choose your family. Choose those around you. (sighs) Coastline Church, will, will you make the decision today, even, that your faith would lift up your family, would lift up God, would elevate him higher than anything else? Will you make strong business decisions that say, I don't, I care more about what God is saying than the bottom line? I, I want to make decisions that represent and honor my family and my kids. I want to have great relationship with them. I want to choose forgiveness and humility and not make decisions out of fear or frustration. And this is the great kind of twist of this story. Because up to this point, we've been like, it's fear of man or it's fear of God. It's one or the other. But there's another thing that Rahab is fearful of, and it's her past. Rahab wasn't scared of the king of Jericho. She was more fearful that her past would impact the generations to come than what the king of Jericho could do right here in this moment. The greatest danger, one of the greatest dangers potentially to your home might just be what you have allowed to be stored up in your home. Let me say this with all the love and grace in in my heart. I'm not trying to come at your home because there are many faithful, loving, generous discipling, like, filled homes that represent this community. But understand that there may be, might be things that we have allowed or not allowed or pushed away that actually have created culture in our homes that create, like, tensions for our kids and grandkids. Alcoholism. Maybe, maybe for you, you had someone in your family who, was, who, who, who really was just, unfortunately, alcoholism just tore them apart left and right. And so maybe for you, you've decided, no alcohol in the house, ever, never. We don't even talk about it. We don't even, we don't even ever bring it up. And whether it be the past of alcoholism or now the like, religious, like, it's the worst and it's going to cause pain. Either way, we're creating, we're storing up fear about something that God wants to bring freedom in for your life and for the future generations of your family. And so we have to understand that. We have to, we have to see that. We have to come to God and we have to make decisions like Rahab and say, listen, I right now, more than anything else, am making a decision to stand firm in God for the rest of our days. I choose faith. I choose family. I choose legacy. I know that my past may negatively impact my kids. And so right now, I believe that God, faith in him, can break the chains of my sin and can set us up as a family to live as a family of faith and legacy and and togetherness. Are you hearing me this morning? That's what Rahab is doing. That's what she's trying to do here. And I think it matters. It matters to me. I hope it matters to you that all of this, friends, can be broken in one moment. 
that Rahab's saying, will you, will you just, as I have shown kindness, would, you, would, would, your, would your Lord show kindness to us? And this is what happens. Ultimately, Rahab marries Salmon, an Israelite from the tribe of Judah. And her son was Boaz, the husband of Ruth. And Ruth was the great-grandmother of King David, Joseph, the legal lineage of King David. Friends, her decision, her faith impacted so much more than just the moment, but her entire lineage, her entire line. That's what happens when you say, I know my past isn't perfect, but I know my God is. And if I'll step into faith, man, I'm leaving a legacy far better than any retirement fund, far better than any real estate project, I'm leaving a legacy that stands on God and God alone. We don't want to live in fear for our kids or grandkids or or parents or brothers and sisters. And Rahab says, that's actually what scares me the most. But God has such a wonderful grace and mercy for you and for me. She recognizes like, man, all I need is, is him. And if I can put him in my heart and if I can bringing him close, if I can re- recognize I'd need him more than anything else, my past family mistakes, the, maybe for some of you, you even thought of generational curses, which I don't, again, we don't have time to unpack, but all of those things for you feel heavy-weighted. One decision, deciding right now, say, I choose God. I choose that my family stands on God and nothing else. It changes everything. And I hope and pray that when you go pick up your kids today, if you have them here, it changes something for you that you'll say, you know what? I do choose the responsibility. I do choose to disciple my kids. We are gonna pray every single night before bed, no matter how tired or cranky or how many bowls of sugar my son has eaten. Tonight, we pray. We pray grace. We pray hope. Andy, Andy and Lisa always do this, and I've taken it from them because I love it. He always, I'll hear him pray that to spare his kids from rebellion and that the Holy Spirit would be in his kids from a very young age. And I just, tears come to my eyes when I hear that, and so I pray that over every single one of my kids because I want the same thing. I want the same thing. Do you want the same thing, church? Her lineage becomes the Savior's. Canaanite prostitute. But everyone's road to Calvary is different. That's a hymn. I'm positive. Where's Luke? I looked it up. It's a hymn. Right, Pastor Ron? It's an old hymn? Ron said yes. Can we have it at the end? Thank you. That'd be great. If you could just play that later. I haven't yet reached the spot where I can just ask for a song mid-sermon and it'll, it'll happen. And you know, that's one thing, but. Can I read to you the final set of verses today? Final set, verse 14. It says this as we close. Our lives for your lives, the Israelites respond. The men assured her of this. Our lives for your lives. If you don't tell what we are doing, we will treat you kindly and faithfully when the Lord gives us the land. So she, so she let them down by a rope through the window, for the house she lived in was part of the city wall. She said to them, go to the hill so that the pursuers will not find you. Hide yourselves there three days until they return, and then go on your way. Verse 17, now the men said to her, this oath you made us, this oath you made us swear will not be binding on us unless when we enter the land, you have this, please hear this, tied this scarlet cord in the window through which you let us down. And unless you have brought your father and your mother and your brothers and all your family into the house, if any of them go outside your on the excuse me outside your house into the street, their blood will be on their heads. We will not be responsible. But as for those who are in this house with you, their blood will be on our head if your if a hand is laid on them. But if you tell what we're doing, we will be released from this oath you made us swear. Agreed, she replied. Let it be as you say. So she makes an oath. And what do they ask of her? Did you catch that? By this scarlet cord that you were letting us down, bind this to your window. Bind it to your home. And that will be the representation. We will know that as, guys, can I be honest? Destruction is coming to this city. The Israelites are about to conquer. They are. They're on their way. Joshua 6. We'll read about it later. And they say, listen, but if we see this cord, by this cord, kindness will be shown. Freedom will be shown. Safety, security, friends, salvation will be shown by the scarlet cord. And and if you if you if you understand the scarlet cord, and this isn't a cord very well, but to represent what it is, it's not just a fancy cord. It represents something more than just red or the scarlet color. The scarlet cord represents Jesus. 
And we see him coming in the Old Testament here in this moment. They're saying, bind this to your home. Just as, as sin and destruction and fear comes, the one thing you need, the one thing that will protect you, the one thing that brings security and safety and salvation, they're saying that cord will let us know. Friends, the scarlet cord represents the scarlet thread of the Old Testament, which all points to Jesus. He says this oath is binding if you decide. You choose. And so I want us to be a church that says, I'm choosing that. I'm binding it to my heart. I'm putting it in my home. My house will praise God. We will choose to make sure that I will disciple my kids. I will love them well. I will, dis- I will love my friends in ways that, that seem scandalous and ridiculous. I will do whatever it takes, but I will put Jesus close to me. I will bind him everywhere I can on, in, 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 my, in my home, in my schoolwork, in my, at, at my job, whatever it is. I, I want to take it. I'm going to put it so close. And that scarlet cord represents that very same thing. Friends, unhealthy fear, it leads to isolation, it leads to desperation, and it goes hand in hand and eventually will just distract. But God is asking us, I believe God is asking us as a church even now that we have to make a choice. We gotta, we gotta be like Rahab in the face of fear to bind that cord, to hold it firmly, to bring our family in and to say, I'm going to do whatever I can to continue to make sure Jesus is the foundation of our family, nothing else. Because fear is going to come, right? And we'll have to handle it in moments. But there has to be a stable foundation at home so that when fear comes, we know especially that our house, my house, your house, this church represents something bigger and stronger than just the moment. It represents the generations to come. We've said this from the start, that we're putting of emphasis and focus on the next generation. Friends, they're coming. They're, they're getting older. They're growing. It's happening. And this cord is what tied her to safety and to God. And Jesus is the scarlet cord that ties you and your family to freedom and salvation. Your past is gone. Your present is on its way. It's Jesus. He's coming. He's saying, listen, I will be that rock. I will be that need. I will be the peace. Friends, I know there's someone in here whose heart just feels like it's missing something. It's the love of Jesus. Don't fill it with more fear, but take a step and say, by faith, I choose grace, I choose love. Don't allow fear to force your praise and service toward the fragile kings and kingdoms of the world. Friends, they break down. The Roman Empire, the Greek camp, all fall, all come down. There is one, and his name is Jesus. And instead of giving you one last thought, I want, to, I want us to read a verse together. But you get to choose. You get to decide. You get to make that decision. Would you stand to your feet with me? I want, to, I want you to potentially bind this verse even to your heart. We all have a choice today. We all face fear. It's real. But, but fear not. Do not be discouraged, for I will go with you, says the Lord. We can receive grace. We can receive mercy. We can understand that our past, yeah, I may leave some, some failure, but there is a God who changes pasts. There is a God who changes generations. There is a God who would say, I see this trajectory, but I am ready to take you on a whole new journey if we would just submit to that grace and that wonder and that beauty. And right here, there's a shift. And at the end of Joshua's life, at the end of his life, he makes this big speech. They, they conquer, they divide lands, not to give away the whole story, and people are going different directions, and it's great. And Joshua says, before, before everyone goes, i got one thing I want to tell you. Let us not go back to what we were doing. Let's not go start worshiping and serving other places. Let's not start taking up idols this way or that way. Be obedient. Follow God. Have faith in him. And this is what he says. This is Joshua 24, verse 15. I know many of you have heard, heard this before. But if serving the Lord, this is his final word, seems undesirable to you, then choose for yourself this day whom you will serve. Whether the gods your ancestors served beyond the Euphrates or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you are living. He's saying, listen, you have the choice. There's lots of things to worship. There's a lot of decisions out there. You, you will get that. But, come on, somebody. You know where I'm going with this. As for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. Yeah. 
I know there's fear. I know there's fear, guys. We're all there together. But fear not. We have a God who goes with us. And he's asking us to stand up strong. And he's asking us to be full of faith. And he's asking us to be discerning. And he's asking us right now, and Joshua said it over his people, and we're saying it now as a church collectively together, as for me and my house and my kids and the generations to come, I will set up a legacy of faith that starts now and so that my kids and my kids' kids and my great-grandkids and the kids that I may never meet will serve God, will honor the Lord, will have a faith that stands true. So one more time, read it with me, all together now. You make the decision. Please don't read it together just because we're, I'm asking you to. You decide right here in this moment where your family goes. When you go to pick up your kids, when you head home, you decide. We choose together. You choose. One more time. But as for me and my household, we will Come on, we will Heavenly Father, this morning right now, I pray for every person who has found themselves in tension points with kids or with, with fear. I pray in Jesus' name that for the household that feels trapped by what maybe it is alcoholism or abuse or difficulty or financial restraint, God, I pray in Jesus' name that you would break the chains that have held moms and dads and grandparents back, that the person who feels like they're headed for fear would pick up the mantle of faith, that right now in this church, in, this, in these pews, at this service, people would say there is a legacy of faith starting here and now. God, I pray for the person who is saying it for the very first time, God, I just want to choose you in my heart, in my life. I've been living astray in fear, and I choose faith and grace and love in my Jesus Christ. If that's you, go ahead and lift up your hands. If, if for you, you know your house, your, your family, we've been serving other gods. I choose to serve you, Lord. R lift up your hands. Right now, make the declaration. Be obedient and say something is changing here this morning. So Heavenly Father, by your power, by your spirit, in ways that only you can, we ask that grace would come over this place. I pray in Jesus' name that families would turn from the disobedience maybe and brought to obedience and faith and purpose and hope and life. God, for the family who's felt distracted and heavy burdened, would you bring rest and peace? And in Jesus' name, would we be a church that say, for our houses, we will serve you, Lord. And everybody said? Come on, let's, everybody said, come on, let's worship.